good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at Science Gallery in Bengaluru's exhibition season, Psyche. Uh, for those of you who are new, Science Gallery Bengaluru is a public institution for research-based engagement, and Psyche is our fifth exhibition season, completely digital, which explores the complexities of the human mind. Today, we have an extremely interesting panel discussion titled Thinking in a Dish, Stem Cell Research and the Human Brain. Before I go ahead and introduce our discussants, I'd like to tell you a bit more about the rest of the programs that are happening this weekend. This is the second last weekend of Psyche and the exhibition closes on the 15th of May. Uh, today evening, later on, we have Can the Mind Be Measured? Intelligence and its Quantifications, a lecture by historian of science, John Carson at 6.30 p.m. And we also have tomorrow another interesting panel discussion Quantifying Subjective Humanness Through the McGill Pain Questionnaire, an event with artist Eugenie Lee, pain scientist Nick Packer, and osteopath Sanya Martek. Now I'd like to introduce to you our three discussants for this afternoon. First, uh, Professor Raghu is the Dean of Research at NCBS DIFR. He trained in clinical medicine and then obtained a PhD in the area of cellular neuroscience. Following postdoctoral training at the University of Cambridge, he was a Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, David Phillips Fellow, and subsequently a faculty member at the Babraham Institute, UK, and the University of Cambridge. Since 2010, he has been a member of the NCPS faculty. His current interests include the genetic and cellular basis of human mental illness with a focus on neural signaling systems. Our next discussant is uh, Sridhar Venkatapuram. Sridhar brings health-related natural and social sciences together with philosophy in order to understand and address health inequalities and injustices. He is an associate professor in global health and philosophy and deputy director of the King's Global Health Institute. He's an academic practitioner in the area of global health ethics and justice. Sridhar has been at the forefront of global health for over 25 years, starting as a researcher at the Human Rights Watch documenting HIV AIDS related abuses in India in 1994. He has degrees in international relations, history, global public health, sociology, and political philosophy. Before joining King's, he was a Wellcome Trust Research Fellow and lecturer in ethics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and an affiliated lecturer at Cambridge University. And last, uh, but not least, absolutely, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sujata Raman. Sujata joined the Center for Public Awareness in Science at the Australian National University in July 2018 as research director and leader. She has been recently appointed the UNESCO chairholder in science communication for the public good. At CPAS, she is exploring the contribution that science communication research and practice can make to stimulating new conversations at the interface of science, innovation, democracy, and global challenges. She has a background in the social studies of science and technology with a particular interest in collaborative research between science and social sciences. I'd also like to remind our audience that there will be an interactive Q&A at the end of the discussion. So please do share your questions in the Q&A box. The panelists will be most happy to answer them at the end of the session. We are also sharing a link to a feedback form in the chat. So please do share your thoughts about the program and what other programs Science Gallery could do going forward. I'll now invite our three panelists uh, to begin by sharing their thoughts on the topic of today's discussion. Over the last seven years or so, uh, scientists at NCBS where I work, along with colleagues from the Institute for Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine, and the National Institute for Mental Health and Neurosciences, all in Bangalore, have been engaged in research work to obtain scientific insights that can inform solutions for the clinical manage management of mental illness by doctors. There are many pressing clinical demands. These include better ways of diagnosing mental illness, a more accurate prediction of who might fall ill and how their illness might proceed, and of course, more effective ways of treating patients once they're diagnosed with mental illness. And this includes personalized solutions, personalized medicine solutions for an individual patient. There are of course, many ways that one can study the human brain. And this includes brain imaging, genetic analysis, 
uh, functional studies, as well as the use of stem cells, which is a recent entrant into this field. Why stem cells, you might ask? Well, although there are many ways of studying the human brain, one challenge that we face is that we are not able to directly observe the cells that make up the human brain and monitor their activity. This is because unlike other tissues in the body, such as the liver, the kidney, or the blood, it is not possible to obtain a biopsy from the brain of a living patient. However, modern stem cell technology developed over the last 10 years or so has provided a solution for this going forwards. So how do we do this? Well, in order to appreciate this, uh, this slide indicates how the whole process works. During normal fetal development, following fertilization, there are a series of steps that occur in utero, resulting in the development of the fetus and ultimately uh, a child is born. When, and, and these steps occur entirely in utero. What one can do these days is, for example, take a sample of blood from uh, a human patient, uh, isolate the blood cells and the white cells, and then reprogram them using new methods in stem cell technology to generate stem cells that are now able to be grown in a dish in the lab. Further, using these stem cells and using our understanding of how brain development occurs in humans, we are then able to convert these stem cells into brain tissue. This is shown in the next slide. On the left-hand side, you can see stem cells growing in culture within a dish. And once we provide the necessary information and cues, these stem cells undergo differentiation in a series of steps. And you can see what they look, at, look like at two days of culture, uh, 10 days of culture and so on, until by the time you get to about 80 days or so, you can see that these cells are now forming small blobs of tissue that in some ways resemble what you see if you were to take out a human brain from a patient and keep it in the dish. Now, of course, some of you might be thinking that this just looks like a bit of tissue. And is this really brain? And can we learn anything about how the brain functions using this? Well, as it turns out, it is indeed very much like brain tissue. And this, this slide shows you a microscopic image of the tissue that you saw in the previous slide that has been stained to reveal the various types of cells within that white mass of tissue. What you can see on the left-hand side in, in red um, is a protein that is marking all those cells that are the stem cells in the brain that are continuously dividing and giving rise to the structure of the brain. And as these organoids, as they're called, are maintained in culture, they progressively increase in size. On the right, you can see this, uh, a similar organoid that has been stained with some other markers. And what you're seeing here in green are the stem cells. And what you're seeing in red are markers that are very typical of cells that form the neurons in a human brain. So not only can you see the cell types that you normally see in a human brain in the organoid, but they're also arranged in a manner with an architecture that allows them to develop as though they are going to form the structures that normally constitute uh, a human brain. Now, not only do we have cell types which are appropriate for the human brain in an organoid, but you also have activity. I'm going to show you now a movie where you're, watching, you're going to watch the cells of the, of the human brain in culture as they show their activity which ultimately results in the output of the brain, which is behavior. As you watch this movie, you will see that there are various cells and uh, which have these cell bodies and axons. And these are connecting to each other to form a network. And you'll be able to see flashes of bright light that represent an indicator that is telling us that these cells are active. And as the movie plays, you will see that the various cells are firing together and forming a network. As some of you may know, the brain is not only composed of individual cells, but they're connected together to form a network. And the activity of this network ultimately gives rise to that emergent property of the brain, which we call behavior. So I'll stop here and, 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 and just acknowledge the Department of Biotechnology and the Pratichya Trust 
that's been funding this very important project, which is now in its seventh year and is expected to run for about 30 years. And the goal at the end of this is to be able to try and understand how human brain disorders arise and use that information to try and develop new methods for the management of mental illness in humans. Thank you. Thank you for that um, amazing overview of your research, Raghu. Um, I think I'm supposed to be up next in the uh, conversation on the panel. Um, so my name is uh, Sujata, Sujata Raman, um, and uh, I'm going to uh, bring a perspective that is derived from my field of um, research, which is as a scholar of science. Um, I say I'm a scholar of science rather than in science, because um, what I'm interested in, the, the field that I work in, um, is uh, broadly called science and technology studies or social studies of science. Uh, and what we're interested in in our field is um, how we make decisions about uh, scientific matters, um, how we frame them, uh, how we talk about them, and maybe um, uh, more kind of speculatively, um, more hopefully, um, exploring sort of better ways at which, uh, in which we can sort of operate at this uh, interface between um, science, uh, new technologies, new technological capabilities, and broader uh, social uh, societal uh, concerns. Uh, so that's the sort of area of work that I'm coming from. Uh, and I want to just point to sort of three uh, broad um, uh, uh, sort of starting points uh, uh, from which we approach uh, most areas of new um, technological uh, capabilities. Uh, so the first one is um, what I think can be broadly described as limits to knowledge. Uh, so here the assumption is that for the most part, um, humans are, uh, if you like, um, you know, constrained by a number of limitations. Um, on the one hand, we do these amazing things like we have just heard from um, Raghu, you know, describing this research. Um, but at the same time, the phenomenon, uh, the phenomena that we um, are studying or the, that we are uh, having to cope with uh, are highly complex, of course. Uh, and for the most part, our knowledge is um, multiple and partial uh, and sometimes uh, contested. Um, so from that uh, standpoint, um, the ways in which we know something like mental illness uh, is going to be, uh, and is, I think, as, as we all probably know, um, uh, there is an element of contestation um, to how we know, how, how we designate uh, people as being mentally ill um, uh, and so on. So there, there's, a, there's a sort of uncertainty, there's a deep uncertainty uh, that we have to uh, think about when it comes to uh, what we do about uh, new technological capabilities and you know, how we engage um, with the kinds of um, uh, developments, the experiments that um, Raghu has just talked about. Um, and uh, maybe a way of specifying this further is that uh, on the one hand, we all share uh, some intuitions by uh, virtue of being human when it comes to mental phenomena, right? Um, it's quite different from uh, uh, areas of technological capability that seem, you know, completely um, abstruse, uh, abstract. Uh, just today in my class, I was talking about um, quantum phenomena, uh, and you know, my students kind of struggled to uh, apply some of the broader perspectives from uh, social studies of science to think about um, quantum technologies and quantum futures, uh, precisely because you know it just seems. Um, highly, um, uh, yeah, highly abstract. Now, uh, obviously, uh, brain uh, tissue research is equally complex, um, equally challenging. Uh, but at the same time, um, by virtue of being human, we all bring, you know, certain intuitions to the matter. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, the way in which we might describe uh, the problem that Raghu, um, you set up uh, at the start of your presentation. Um, and that's to do with mental, uh, mental uh, illness. You know, how we know this as a scientist, uh, how, we know this as a, how we know this phenomenon as a person suffering from uh, mental illness, uh, or maybe a person caring for somebody with uh, mental illness, these things are all going to probably, uh, this would be my hypothesis, uh, these are probably going to be uh, somewhat different. Uh, and so therefore, um, moving on to my second point, um, Given these conditions of deep uncertainty um, and to some extent the limitations of our knowledge, 
um, derived from uh, from the the kind of partial partiality, the way the, the kinds of frameworks that we bring uh, to bear on these matters. Um, we have to think about um, what are the kinds of processes uh, through which we um, handle um, new technological uh, capabilities, right? Um, and so. Here I want to uh, appeal to a concept which is um, maybe highly abused. Um, uh, it's a concept of uh, you know, democratic deliberation um, is something that seems highly utopian, uh, especially in this day and age when we know that um, from history as well as you know, what is unfolding at present, uh, we know that our democratic institutions are imperfect. Uh, we know that uh, democratic life, you know, everyday life, um, there are it's, uh, they, they are sort of marked by uh, disappointments, if you like. Uh, but nonetheless, we don't have an alternative, right? Um, if we are, um, as a human race, if we are gonna to have to um, deal with um, new, um, amazing developments, amazing capabilities that, um, that, we, that we have developed um, as, as, uh, as, uh, as humanity, um, we have to develop some way of, um, thinking about these from uh, a democratic standpoint. Um, and so that's something that is, um, you know, I guess a, a perennial concern as well in, in my field. And that then leads me to the third uh, and final point that I want to make, um, which is that if we have these, if we admit or acknowledge that we, there are certain limitations to our knowledge, um, uh, and if we um, acknowledge that uh, the way forward when it comes to new capabilities, is having the kinds of um, you know, wider conversations that uh, the Science Gallery uh, in uh, Bengaluru has been so successful in organizing. Um, one of the questions we are going to have to think maybe a little bit harder about is how do we talk about technological capabilities in a way that can be um, inclusive, right? Um, one of the points that I just want to flag here is that uh, when we put technological capabilities up front, when we put them um, sort of, you know, at the center of the conversation, uh, and when we frame conversations as, uh, well, these technological capabilities can help us uh, deal with uh, problems that we know that we have. So in this case, you know, men mental illness. Uh, when we frame things in that way, so here we've got a problem and here we've got a solution in, in the form of, um, uh, yeah, these new ways of knowing um, uh, what, what's going on in the brain. Um, I think there's a potential danger there, uh, not just in terms of opening up, um, you know, concerns, uh, fears, and so on that people might have, but uh, equally concerns about, um, oh, there's an issue here, uh, if you like, about um, raising hopes, um, raising hopes that we may or we, as in you know, the broader research community, um, hopes that we may or may not um, be capable of fulfilling, right? Uh, so the kind of promissory nature um, of, um, uh, of these conversations around emerging technologies, or emerging technological capabilities is something that I think uh, would be um, maybe interesting or useful to uh, talk about. Is this how we want to frame this issue? Um, do we want to have this kind of problem solution um, kind of structure to a conversation? Um, because, yeah, like I said, um, this is something that um, in other domains, I think we have observed that, um, uh, you know, it's one can make promises as uh, a researcher, um, but it's not entirely in a researcher's control um, to be able to, if you like, fulfill or deliver those promises. It depends on, you know, a whole host of other um, uh, systemic factors. Um, it also depends on how people kind of react and support um, this area of work. Uh, so on that note, um, let me stop and uh, turn over to um, Sridhar. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start first by saying that I apologize if you have any technological issues with my voice and my internet. I'm just noticing that there is a certain amount of um, interference. So I will speak slowly uh, and hopefully that will be able to manage any kind of problems that um, my system is, uh, is giving. But firstly, I want to thank the Science Gallery for inviting me to participate and to my colleagues on this panel 
it's um, they're both sort of quite distinguished individuals, and so it's a, it's a lovely opportunity for me to learn about what they do, and also think uh, with you all and with them about this very uh, compelling uh, situation. So my perspective on this is as coming as a political philosopher and an ethicist, looking at the health issue and at stake and what the kind of solution or a, a way that we're looking at it and trying to figure out how we can reason through some of the known issues that we think are ethical sort of quandaries or things that we may not know and we need to sort of think about uh, how we sort of have some standards in which we sort of assess uh, this kind of activity. So for those of you who are not familiar with why we would want an ethical perspective in this kind of science endeavor, which has a very clear aim of trying to reduce mental illness. I guess the, the first way of approaching to answer that question is to say, what would it look like? Were there no ethics? And what would this kind of scientific research look like if there were no ethics involved? So one of the earlier <clears throat> sort of, as, as, the, you know, as we heard, is that we can't necessarily take someone's, uh, a piece of someone's brain in order to find out why and how it works or why there's mental illness. And that is because there's this sense that, you know, there is no spare brain part of individuals. All of them are necessary for the individual to be able to function and survive. And so it's the respect for that individual and their life and their functioning that we actually don't go in and take a piece of their brain, even though we might actually learn quite a lot. This has not been historically true in that uh, this has not always been the case. There have been many instances where human beings were in a way used and abused and sacrificed in order to do science and in order to learn more about how the body functions or different kinds of diseases progress or you know, how different kinds of uh, you know, organisms interact with the body, et cetera. And so that would be an example or many examples where there are very poor ethics or no ethics where we sort of actually don't respect the individual and their well-being and their life but we nevertheless might actually do really good science we might learn new things we might learn really important things we might learn a lot of um, important knowledge that actually can help quite a lot of people however one of the reasons that we are you know, sort of in this particular situation of trying to find many different ways of uh, identifying a sort of solution to this uh, problem of mental illness and the high prevalence of it is to essentially create brain cells that uh, you know are growing and are trying to learn as much as we can about how the brain works, but also try to understand in sort of a brain or brain cells with someone who's got a mental illness how it works and what it doesn't. So there, in itself, is an ethical position that I want us to recognize: is that there's a sense that you know, we can't just go into an individual, we actually have to find a different way of addressing this problem. So that's, I think, a way for me to explain why ethics and why we need kind of ethics. Um, and so what's happened is that over the last 50 years or so, um, we have been, uh, you know, sort of working in terms of medicine, but also in scientific research around some basic ethical principles that are called the bioethics principles. Um, and they've largely, or they originated in the United States in the late 1960s, and they've now essentially, um, you know, sort of gone around the world and have become sort of the standard uh, that which we sort of think about in terms of doctor, patient, practice, as well as research and subject. Um, and then also they are reflected in global sort of standards of medical research and medical practice. And these ethical principles include the respect for autonomy of the individual, non-malfeasance, um, that is that the, you know, the researcher or doctor isn't sort of only trying to harm the individual um, or sort of the do no harm principle. And the third one is beneficence, which is that what that, in, that practitioner wants to do in terms of research or uh, in the medical setting is to actually benefit the patient, not someone else. And the last sort of principle is this idea of justice. And for uh, many decades, that principle has just meant that individuals in a medical care setting should uh, not be somehow unfairly discriminated against, that they should have 
uh, the relevant healthcare for the need that they have. So it's an appropriate uh, sort of dessert notion that justice means that you get what you deserve, meaning you get what you need in that kind of situation. So these principles have been applied to medical research and then also sort of novel health technologies as well. And so one could then go about sort of trying to apply, well, what, which of these principles you know, actually, you know, sort of applies, how could it guide the different kinds of research that is being done. Um, but however, what's happened in more recently, and I think over the last two decades, is that there has been a critique that these four principles are insufficient, um, and that they actually don't reflect accurately in some other really important values that people have around the world, which is that, for example, it's not just the individual that is at stake in any kind of medical uh, scenario or even research scenario. There's also a family and a community as well. So there must be some sense of uh, incorporating the, the kind of well being and the interests of family and, and sort of community. Um, and many other people have started to ask uh, about sort of potentially other kinds of ethical principles that are at stake. A second and something that I uh, actually am interested in, and this is the kind of work that I do, is to go beyond kind of the medical setting and the lab setting and to think about the population and trying to understand what the ethical and equity issues are when we move not uh, as so when we don't center on the individual, but we start to center on groups and populations. And so, for example, in this case, we might be actually interested in the 193 million people suffering mental illnesses in India. And we sort of know that mental health is uh, woefully under-resourced, under-recognized, and considered to be shameful, and individuals with severe mental illness are treated uh, poorly, and poorly is just a, not a good word to describe some of the heinous experiences that people with severe mental illnesses experience in India. And so this kind of research then, is an expression or an extension of our desire to be able to help those individuals live better lives or actually uh, you know, sort of prevent other individuals in the future who, who sort of might suffer greatly as a result. And so this kind of research is trying to, to do that. So there's lots of current debate right now about what should constitute in public health ethics and how should we sort of think about it and what we should do. And then there's also what we would consider global health ethics, and that's a whole different other ballgame. And many of us who've been dealing with the pandemic have, I think, and all of you who've experienced the pandemic recognize that ethics and equity has global dimensions that we need to think about in all of these different ways. So I can't sort of go through all of the different issues, but what I wanted to do is for people who are interested in ethics is to then sort of say, okay, so given that we have these bioethics principles, these public health principles, and also these questions around global equity, what are the different kinds of issues that could be prominent in these research, in this research that is being done? So one of the most important sources of knowledge are the researchers themselves. It's always important, I think, when you're trying to apply ethics to a given case or situation to ask the people that are actually involved to say, what do you think are the difficult decisions here to be made? Um, and I hope that in our discussion, we will have um, sort of more sort of insight into what individuals who are actually doing the research think are sort of difficult ethical issues. I would sort of lay out a couple of things to think about um, in the coming future, in particular regarding this stuff. One is that, you know, there clearly is, this is sort of uh, very novel cutting edge kinds of scientific research, which is essentially growing brain cells, but little organoids that look like brains. And so the question is, when does this stop? To what extent is this going to continue? Um, and then we have this question of like, when does intelligence begin? And what does that mean? What does it mean for us to be able to create intelligence? And, and, and what is the kind of our rights and duties or obligations towards those kinds of things. Is it a life? Is it living? Is it not? What do we think about them? The kind of more uh, sort of other things that I think are really quite pressing here is that in order to address mental illness, we are growing sort of brain cells. 
And but it might be that there's lots of things that we learn about the brain, not just about mental illness. And so those kinds of questions require us to think, are these the right questions? Could there be uh, sort of scientific research here that may not be so well intentioned or for the benefit of you know, all human beings, but particularly some human beings, et cetera. Um, and so those are some questions that I would have. And the third and fourth, and I'm gonna end on these last two points, is that overwhelmingly, as many of us have experienced or most of us experienced, science and the commercial uh, sort of sector have become intertwined. And so there's no longer, and there used to be, I think 50, 70 years ago, the sense that there was a public science, that we did scientific endeavor for the public benefit. But more increasingly now, no matter where somebody does science, there is usually a very quick path to a commercial part of this. So I would be very interested in seeing and learning more about the commercial interest and engagement in this kind of research because uh, you know, it, the commercial uh, sort of sector has its own kind of uh, rationale and purpose and that may go off in a different direction than what we want to do. And the last thing is that I think that the global equity part here is really important. So this research is being done in India and it's sort of at the forefront of it, but that actually could quite impact, you know, what sort of things that it is focused on, what is the aims and what is the methods and what are the implications for the global picture. And so I think those are all interesting things. So with that, I'm going to now um, hand it back to um, my colleagues so that we can now sort of see what each other uh, thinks about our comments so far and perhaps uh, move the comment uh, sort of discussion forward jointly as well. So over to you. Yeah, um, thank you, Sridhar and Sujata. Um, I thought perhaps we could start by talking about uh, the technology itself, because clearly the technology, uh, merely by the nature of what it can achieve, is, is very inviting and it's, it's spectacular. Uh, but uh, there are a couple of points that I, I want to uh, raise from the point of view of uh, being someone who carries out that type of technology or implements that type of technology. And the first is that uh, when we do these sorts of things in the laboratory, and I must uh, pause for a moment to emphasize that all the research that we do is restricted to laboratory science. None of this is anywhere close to a stage being uh, taken into, into patients. So when you do things in the, in the lab um, and word gets out that these types of things are possible, there is immediately a... Um, there is a surge of interest, uh, a hope and expectation from the general public about how that could be applied for the benefit of uh, other human beings, uh, groups, smaller groups or populations. And one of the big challenges is, is to keep that hope alive, but at the same time, um, explain what the limitations of it are, and also in a nuanced way indicate what one might expect to get from this technology and in what time frame. So many times these days I get calls from um, uh, people, members of the public. Uh, they've heard about this type of research going on uh, within the program. And it's typically the case that is somebody in their family who has an illness of the brain. And is it is it likely that uh, this research is going to uh, to be able to be applied to to cure their their family member. Now, impressive as it looks, uh, the the structures that I showed you uh, are all very immature uh, brain tissue. They we can these days maintain these cultures and grow the brains up to about ninety days or three months. And even at that stage, uh, it has not even reached the equivalent of the brain of a newborn child. So it's still somewhat 
of an immature brain of a child that is undergoing development uh, in utero. The second thing is that you might have noticed that the tissue was very, very white in color. And the reason for that is that regardless of where you do, you're doing this in the world, there is one very important limitation to producing the brain in a dish. And that is that all these that are produced right now come without a very critical component that our own brains have, which is a blood supply that provides nutrition and oxygen, both of which are very important for the brain to, to function. Uh, these sorts of things are typically not highlighted in the popular narrative of uh, of stem cell derived brain tissue or any other tissue uh, in the lab. And therefore it becomes a challenge to, uh, to provide a balanced explanation to the public of where this technology can go and what are the time frames in which they can expect to, to benefit from it. Obviously for most patients, a benefit means something that will help to cure or their own condition. And that is, a, I think, a significant challenge uh, today. Yeah, th thank you for, um, for that observation. I think it, um, uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear you describe um, from, from your perspective, this is already, so on the one hand, it's really exciting, but equally, you know, there are a number of limitations to actually translating um, work that's done in the, in the lab to um, um, you know to real world applications and um, so I guess yeah I was wondering if you see this one of the curious things about most uh, emerging technology um, discourses if you like um, is that there's usually a story that that is told which is you know here's a problem and here's a solution right. Um, and everything else that's in between that you've just been describing, all the limitations, the uncertainties, um, you know, even uh, treatments that might um, emerge, you know, they are going to presumably have their own limitations. You know, they, they might work in certain conditions and not others or certain contexts and certain people, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, somehow it, it, those inconvenient details, if you like, you know, sort of get uh, stripped out from the, from the narrative. And I guess I'm wondering, is, is this, I mean, is part of the issue here that, um, uh, so I guess I'm wondering, like, could you, could we, could you talk about the research um, from the other perspective? So in other words, rather than starting from the, the problem to which it might be a solution, um, in a way really talking about um, the basic science uh, and ha and sort of you know all the amazing um, sort of findings of uh, that you have been uh, you've been working with in the in the lab. So I yeah I guess in a way for, for me this is one of the the warnings um, from just having observed uh, and studied a lot of these emerging technology uh, cases that it's not just concerns. It's not just that it might raise fears, but as you say, you know, excessive and too early um, hopes. Um, and part of the problem here is, I think, you know, managing that. But yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe what we could talk about is that something that happens in the media? Um, is it something that is maybe a response to, you know, funding requirements? You know, you have to you have to sort of frame this work in translational context, um, or is there something else going on? Because um, I'm sure in the, in the journal articles, you know, all the nuance and um, limitations are, are all there, um, but when it gets to these other domains, it seems that it disappears. So yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that, but um, Sridhar, I'm sure you have um, your own views. I always have my own views. That's the great part of this. Um, so I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I think, um, trying to understand the relationship uh, or the pathway between mental illness and the growth of the cells into organoids. Um, and I think uh, perhaps that's what Sujata is also interested in because she's sort of saying, we've sort of identified a problem and this is sort of one potential 
pathway to identify a solution to that problem. Um, and I'm also very curious about the kind of scientific relationship between saying that there's 193 million people that are suffering from mental illness. And, you know, so we've got different ways of studying it. And here's one potential way. Could, um, you know, could you help us understand how growing these cells uh, sort of to greater and greater size help us understand mental illness and the potential uh, either prevention of it or cure for it? Like what's the kind of uh, pathway? And the second thing is that, you know, what, so is connecting these little organized to a blood supply the next thing? I mean, is that what I'm, I'm thinking that if, if someone who's sort of, uh, you know, if you're saying that the natural limit to this is because it doesn't have blood supply, I imagine there's somebody trying to figure out how do we, you know, hook it up to a blood supply. So yeah, could you help me with those two sort of questions, I guess? Yeah, uh, maybe the easier one first, um, which is, you know, the there are of course a, a number of people working on the problem of how to how to nourish these growing brains or organoids so that they can keep growing in size. And the reason this is important is because the in the in the human brain the uh, cerebral cortex is vastly expanded compared to all other mammals and and primates um, as well. And therefore, to, to get that growth to go, go on and keep the cells alive, you need the, the blood supply. Now, there's a lot of information about how that blood supply develops during normal development in utero, in, in the fetus. But the challenge is, is to be able to get it to grow uh, in the dish on, on top of and into the brain so that uh, the brain tissue can then be sufficiently oxygenated and, and, and nourished. I think we're some time away from it. The second, the second limiting factor, of course, is that so uh, is that the brain, as we saw it in the dish, is a standalone entity, but in the person or the patient, it's in fact connected to the rest of the body, and the behavior that we speak of as being abnormal in men or unusual in mental illness uh, is, is, is part of the continuum of the brain controlling the movement and behavior of all the various parts of the body. So these are, um, these are natural limits on what, uh, what the organoid technology can achieve. But I think I want to go back to your question of why then are we doing this at all? Um, I think there are two reasons for this. One is that um, we know enough about in the, in the domains of molecular biology and, and cell biology that for most other tissues, we can have those cells in front of our eyes in the dish. We can carry out what is called experimentation, which is typically not possible in an intact human. Many human studies are observational in nature because of boundaries of ethical considerations. Uh, the same is true for the brain. But when you have this tissue growing in the dish in front of you, uh, it is possible to do experimental manipulations to test out certain hypotheses. And that leads to a better understanding of what is different about an abnormal brain uh, compared to a normal one. So that's one reason. The second reason is that, um, you know, um, when, when people, you know, there's been a lot of effort uh, over the last 50 years or so to try and develop um, medications that can be used to treat mental illness. And typically there is a pattern to this. It costs about a hundred million dollars to develop a medicine. It starts in the laboratory with molecules, then it goes to cells. And then typically it ends up being tested out in rodents, uh, rodent models, and then sometimes also in lower primates. And the problem is that many medicines have made it through this path, yet when they've got to the point of being tested in human patients in a phase three trial, they have uh, failed uh, quite miserably. 
And that's one of the reasons why there is not that much enthusiasm uh, in the pharma industry for developing drugs for treating mental illness. Now, one of the reasons for this is that although the mouse is a very good model for many other types of human illness, there is substantive differences between the mouse brain uh, and the human brain. And until this technology was available and you could have these brains going in the dish, it wasn't possible to test out medications or potential medications on brain tissue as we are able to do now. So, so I think this is a significant uh, improvement of prior art. And therefore, um, I think that's one of the things that has enthused and energized a lot of work uh, in this area. Um, the final point is that um, today, of course, we are talking about mental illness in the sense of cognitive de de deficits in humans. But organoid technology has actually not been driven by this particular science question. It has actually been uh, driven by the great interest in stem cell technology in general in trying to produce in the laboratory setting tissues of a particular type that can then be used for a replacement when, when things go, go, go wrong. So for example, you know, you can produce skin or you can produce muscle. Sometimes you can produce blood cells using stem cells and then transplant them into the human patient. Now, in the case of the brain too, there is interest in this, not for mental illness, but for many neurodegenerative conditions such as Parkinson's disease, where there's a deficiency of something. And if you can put back the cells that are missing and therefore causing the deficiency, uh, in the case of Parkinson's disease, that's dopamine producing cells, then you can try and restore function. And that's been one of the dri other drivers of this, uh, this stem cell technology. So I think that's, that's, those are the reasons why one is doing these experiments in the lab, despite the limitations that we already know, know about. Um, that's so one part of the answer. Now, going back to Sujata's point, about why is there the hype surrounding a technology even when it's got its limitations and there are things that don't you know get articulated well one could of course say that it's the press uh, one could also say it's funding agencies and pressures uh, from those sorts of quarters on researchers but it's important to take take a step back and reflect on the, the idea that the only reason why a journalist is interested in something, or most often the only reason why a journalist is interested in something is because there are there is a, either a viewership or a readership that wants to know about, about that issue or that problem. And in the case of illness, it's usually people who are suffering from it um, and who are desperately looking for an avenue to cure the illness either for themselves or for their their family members the the same point applies to the other constituency which is funding agencies public funding agencies set their priorities according to the needs of the society that you know provides them with the resources and elected governments typically set their priorities according to what what is important for their population. And so yet again, in the case of uh, an illness, be it mental illness or infectious diseases, the, the, the need of the population at the time drives the pressure to carry out particular types of research, research activities that carry with them a hope that uh, an outcome will arise at the end of that research activity. So I think that, that those are the drivers why um, there is a tendency to not dwell upon the shortcomings, except in very you know, eclectic circles in science where we debate with academic, uh, you know, it's in a sort of an academic way, the pluses and the minuses or the pros and cons of any particular issue uh, in science. That's really interesting. Yeah, so if I can just jump in on that. Um, so I wonder if there are opportunities then for um, some sort of 
you know, partnership, if you like, with, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know to what extent uh, in the situation you're working in, um, some of these uh, people are sort of organized into, you know, patient groups, um, that sort of thing. Um, but I guess I'm wondering um, if there's an opportunity to do this research um, in, when I say partnership, um, I mean, you know, when you build kind of more sustained uh, longer term relations with, um, uh, with people who are interested in the research, um, there's perhaps a better opportunity to sort of take them along the journey um, and, you know, highlight some of the limitations and, and, and all that sort of stuff, um, which is very hard to do, I think, if you are, I mean, I'd like, I, um, I don't know how you um, deal with the issue when, you know, you get a phone call um, asking about, um, you know, do you have a cure yet sort of thing. You know, that's very hard to do um, in that kind of context. But um, I think one of the interesting things that, um, you know, I'm finding is that in some cases of uh, scientific research, there are these kinds of new um, um, institutional arrangements or new kinds of relationships, science society partnerships, um, that sort of thing, um, which in, uh, yeah, at least in certain cases, um, you know, helping the scientists as well as, um, uh, as, well as the public. Um, so yeah, maybe that's just something to think about. Um, well, in India where, where we are, um, patient interest groups are not as well developed as they might be uh, in the United States or, or in Europe. Uh, but there is one, uh, maybe one, ex and, and I think it's in part because of a, a notion amongst the population that if there is a large medical problem, uh, then it's anyway the responsibility of elected representatives or the government to, to find solutions. But there's one group for which, and the reason I think this is the background to this lack of patient interest groups is that, uh, is that there is one exception to this in India and that is something that's happened over the last five to seven years. And that is that there's a group of diseases called rare diseases. Now, these are ones which, in which the incidence of the diseases um, is lower than one in, in India, we don't have a formal definition. But in general, it's less than one in 100,000 or, or even lower. Uh, some common examples of these are, you know, brain disorder that arise, for example, from glycogen storage diseases um, or Friedrich's ataxia, which is another genetic disease that results in movement disorders. Uh, because many times that these are debilitating but not life-threatening illnesses, uh, what happens is that the patients live for many, many years. And there has developed a sense that because they are rare diseases and any, any potential treatment, I mean, for many glycogen storage diseases, for example, we know why those diseases occur. The replacement of the enzyme is the treatment or the consumption of a modified diet that helps you deal with the metabolic consequences of the illness is the, is the solution. But these are expensive and, and to keep that going for many, many years, uh, is, is, is costly. And then there are also other issues in terms of how such people are, such individuals affected by such illnesses are accepted into society. And because of this, we have this ORD group in India. Uh, they, they, make, uh, they make the case for people with rare diseases. They've petitioned the government to, uh, to make a list of rare diseases, a formal list of what's included in this. And the point about having a formal list is to then write down what might a person with a rare disease expect and what support would the government give to them. And these ORD patient support groups are actually engaged in a dialogue with researchers about new studies that might give insights into how a person with a rare genetic illness can be managed for for the duration of their lifetime. So in that sense, there is patient support groups that, uh, that do engage in a conversation with, uh, with researchers. And some of the phone calls I get are from very informed members of that community. Uh, I mean, the reason they call is 
is not that they think you already have a um, uh, sometimes it's not because they think you already have a solution and they'd like to partake of it but rather that they are they're acting as an advocacy group for for more research into the problem in the hope that something will turn up I could jump in in the last couple of minutes is that so I think this is a really important and area of governance of research and this whole idea of what's good research practice not only within the lab but the sort of when the lab is situated in a society and community what is the kind of you know uh, governance structure that sort of allows for it to, to be done well um, and so you know as you're saying is that you engage with the public in terms of when people call you and sort of want to know about it and um, as, as you're doing in this talk I think that's a really important sort of function I'm sort of curious, can you tell me from your perspective, what are, what are the ethical puzzles that you are currently facing or you think are on the horizon with regard to, you know, these sort of, you know, if I can say growing brain organoids and what, what are you, what, from your perspective, what are the ones that are coming up or currently you're facing that you think require some reasoning or some sort of uh, attention to that. Thanks. Well, I mean, I think one immediate problem that one faces when you're doing this type of research is, is what do you focus on? Do you focus on something that you're interested in that affects five people in the world? Or do you focus on something that affects 190 million people? Uh, uh, obviously, there is there are the, the the rights and requirements of the individual but there are also the rights and requirements of a larger population and it is often difficult to take a call on what the focus of one's research should be that in itself is an ethical question when one is spending public money uh, to advance knowledge so that that's one issue the second issue which i'm which is which has always been around and it's not perhaps unique to, uh, it's not unique to the brain, is that when you are working with stem cells and, uh, you know, there is a question of replacement, um, meaning you replace something that is damaged or, or, or has gone wrong. Uh, in general, in medicine, you have to be reasonably, more than reasonably sure that what you're doing is at least better than than, than, than the situation caused by the illness. And although there have been spectacular advances in stem cell technology, genome editing, and, and genetics, and so on, it is, it really is very difficult, uh, or it is difficult to get to a point where one can be absolutely certain that it is okay to go in and introduce a cell or a gene or edit something in a person's DNA, uh, being certain that you're not doing more harm uh, than what already exists. Um, this, you know, when we, when we do studies in the lab and we publish papers, that's quite a different ball game from taking this into patients. And I think there'll be many questions about when is it right to do so? What are the criteria? Who will decide what the criteria are? I mean, you know, often when experimental medications are available, there is this question that arises in people's minds. I mean, scientists and doctors usually want to be fairly certain that things are going to be okay before they try it out. But you will also have pressure from patients and patient support groups who will say that, who will see it in a different perspective, which is that there is no, there is no other way for us now and so why don't you let us participate in this experimental treatment or experimental maneuver? So I think these are important ethical questions, uh, more generally from the point of view of clinical medicine and how this kind of technology will, will lead to a clinical, clinical application. I mean, from a more basic science point of view, um, 
you know, there is in general a great deal of interest in, in the brain. It's not like any other organ. It's, um, it's got this ability to synthesize things, to synthesize thought. Thought is an emergent property of the brain. You can't sort of spin it down to one part of the brain or the other or one neuron or one circuit. And I think that then leads to the question of when and at what point are these organoids that we are growing in the lab, assuming that all the problems of blood supply could be solved uh, and you could grow a brain to a full size, then what point do you stop? And uh, what is right to do and what is wrong? What is not right to do? I'm not terribly certain of it, but I, I expect that this will be a burning question sooner than later. Can you tell me how long in the future you think that question will become a real question? It's, I mean, it's a real question now, but uh, how, how far away in terms of time are we? To so I, I mean, I, I want to put a number to it, but I, I imagine in, in five years, the debate and the, and the questions surrounding it will be very intense. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Great. It's not very far away. Yeah. No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't know that this was so close. I was. I thought you were going to say about a decade or two decades away. I didn't realize you were going to say five years. But yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, so, colleagues, I think that we hit the hour mark, and I, I, mean, I think we have a question and answer something. So, I see Mother Shri coming on again. So, over to you, Mother Shri. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'd just like to, uh, like, start by asking the audience if you have any questions to add them to the Q and A box. Uh, we'll share them with the discussants. And maybe while we wait uh, for uh, the questions to start coming in, we could just continue with a few questions uh, that uh, might, you know, drawn from the conversation that you guys have been having. And uh, especially since at the end, we came towards this point where we talk were talking about the governance and regulation of this research, especially because Rahu spoke about in the Indian context, there's so much priority given to the state of managing this uh, uh, by the public. So Sujata, maybe you could tell us a bit about, you know, what about regarding guidelines, laws, governance around stem cell research and, you know, in context of clinical therapy and what might be the frameworks that we as a society or as a nation might need to guide us on the way forward, given that it's not too far away. Yeah, I mean, like uh, Sridhar was saying, I think um, I was also, yeah, quite, um, um, I don't know if I should say impressed, but um, yeah, my, I perked up when you said in five, potentially in five years, you know, this could be uh, a real thing. Um, and I suppose, I mean, I, yeah, I just want to go back to um, some of my earlier remarks in the, in the sense that, um, you know, if, if this debate is going to have to happen, it's fantastic in one way that, you know, this is one maybe forum through which um, it could happen, you know, through this, uh, through the science gallery. Um, but I guess I'm wondering, um, uh, you know, when we think about frameworks for, uh, for governance, one of the, um, you know, critical things that uh, we've been finding is that um, in other domains, including you know, previous um, generations of uh, stem cell research uh, is that um, you have to sort of, um, you know, uh, consult, if you like, more widely. Um, and one of the common, um, I, I guess, issues that arises in the way in which, um, uh, you know, people uh, have tried to organize um, uh, regulatory um, inquiries and so forth is that Sometimes there's a tendency to say, okay, we'll have this one bit here where um, we um, leave the scientists, leave the people who are working on this area of research uh, to come up with a consensus, right? Um, and then we do a public consultation, which is sort of separate from that. Um, and I think one of the, um, what we keep finding is that sometimes these boundaries break down when it comes to matters that are, you know, more fundamental, like, you know, should we be uh, providing the blood supply and, you know, growing a brain in the, in the lab and so on and so forth, right? Um, it goes back to some of what I was saying before, which is, you know, those are matters which are, 
potentially uh, in, in principle, you know, something that most of us have something to contribute to, if you like. Um, so, I, and, and then, um, you know, as um, Raghu, you were saying before, some of the people who um, have been getting involved in these conversations uh, with you, um, many of them are really well informed, right? Um, so I guess what I would um, sort of highlight is that, you know, when we start thinking about um, ways of developing guidelines and so forth, um, it would be good to kind of keep it as wide open uh, as possible. Obviously, you have to have some structure and so forth, but you know, keeping keeping that as wide open as, as possible, um, and um, and that and that kind of you know the, those partnerships um, between researchers and others are really important. I think in um, building um, uh, what might be called what might be seen as a trustworthy uh, institutional kind of arrangement at the end, right? because you can come up with all kinds of guidelines, but um, if there isn't sort of public trust in that, um, you know, that's going to then be a problem, right? So the, the process of developing these guidelines, I think um, is part of, um, a part of that kind of, uh, you know, way of gaining cred credibility, building trust and, and that sort of thing. And it's not something that can be done overnight. It's not something that can be done by press release and so forth. It's through that, through those relationships. So. Um, yeah, I guess that's sort of what I would highlight for um, uh, when we think about um, the process that needs to happen before the laws and the guidelines are, you know, actually put into put in place. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sujata. Is there anything, Shridhar or Raghu, that you'd like to add on or uh, to that? Or... So I would. I'm sort of really interested in. So these questions that uh, Raghu just initially pointed out about do you, you know, do you focus on the few or do you focus on the many um, and all stuff. And then Sujata is very much saying keep it wide open as possible. What to me this brings is that there actually could be very um, different kinds of values that are incommensurate in this kind of situation. Um, so this is always the case in the context that I have seen in Europe and the United States and stuff, and that in itself is a problem. I'm on the one hand really curious to see what would a public deliberation in India look like and what sort of values would arise in that kind of conversation. Um, and potentially what are some, you know, novel uh, values that stuff so a lot of people think you know it's the few or the many you know then and so there's some colleagues that tried to do this prioritizing in healthcare exercise in India and asking Indians what do you you know who do you think should get healthcare and one of the counterintuitive uh, conclusions was that poor people say well give the rich people the healthcare because their life will be much better than mine if I got the healthcare. So, you know, they're going to have a much better sort of life, so just give it to them. So I just thought that that's sort of surprisingly counterintuitive, but it also shows you that we need to, we need to, in a way, contextualize even these public deliberations uh, and sort of have both a kind of, um, yeah, we need to reason much more than just simply saying, here's what the public said. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting. I, I'm just very, very super interested in what's going on. Thanks, over. Raghu, is there anything otherwise? Well, I mean, I, I was just going to mention that I, I recently read a paper in a, in a bioethics journal, and it is a paper about seeking opinions from the public or seeking opinions from society, I should say, about studies that involve controlled infections in humans. You know, for example, what would their perception be of a, a study in which you had to infect normal people with a virus and then uh, observe what happens as part of a scientific study? Now, of course, uh, it was a, it's actually a fairly extensive study of over 100 respondents. And it did, it, of course, the, the more professional people who work in this sort of space, they had their expected opinions about the, the, the value of this thing. 
but they also did interview, I think almost 70 people from a rural setting outside Bangalore. Um, and these were not people with extensive education. They're mostly from the farming community outside Bangalore. And it was quite remarkable that despite not knowing too much about the science behind it, uh, when it was explained to them, this is what would be done, this is what we're talking about. Uh, they drew upon um, this concept of participating in order to come up with findings that might uh, uh, might be helpful for the broader public in, in, in the sense of giving informed consent for a study like this. So, I mean, I think that, you know, even in, in India, I think people, regardless of their level of education or training, would have certain opinions. And I think it will be very interesting to find out um, if, if you did a study, what would be the, the views on the technology like this, which they probably haven't even heard of before you explain it to them and ask their view on it. Um, the other thing, of course, is that I just, as a closing point that I would make is that I think, you know, technologies have to develop in this way. If you don't point out the potential of it, then it won't go ahead, despite its current shortcomings. But it's also, I think, equally important to explain to the public um, what the technology is, what it can do for you, what it cannot do for you now, and what it could do for you in the future. And I suppose uh, events such as this one um, will play an important role in explaining small bits of the technology to anybody who sees this on YouTube or, or whatever. So I think that's very important uh, as uh, Sujata was saying, uh, for, for the, when we get to that point where we need public acceptance uh, of a technology that is going to be more broadly introduced into clinical practice, even if it is by uh, governmental regulation and so on. I think I'll stop there. Okay, there is a question from a member of the audience. Um, and essentially their question is, what is your take on the future of this technology in India? Do I guess, do you anticipate it sort of picking up uh, that's going to be more research uh, uh, researchers taking up this and you know uh, diving into it deeper or what do you feel uh, I mean I think um, scientists will always do science and they use whatever technology comes along because if it's discovery you're interested in then that that'll be that'll go ahead but I think the question that's being asked is perhaps more in relation to whether the public would accept a technology or not and I tend to, and I tend to think that acceptance of a technology is not only based on, on what it can deliver potentially, but whether or not there is an alternative technology uh, that is available that is more acceptable. So you know, I think it's very similar to the issue of uh, will people accept transgenic wheat versus non-transgenic wheat. Uh, if I had an illness and the only technology available to cure me was stem cell technology, I might take a different view of it from another situation where there, was, there were two technologies, one promising a lot, but also with some limitations and dangers and another one which didn't have those. And then I might go for the one that is, uh, is, 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 is the, the second one, which is uh, the less, fraught with danger or unexpected outcomes. So I think um, there are some areas of stem cell technology where I expect the uptake will be quite good or going to be well received. Uh, stem cell technology in the area of blood disorders, uh, blood cancers, where taking out cells and replacing the bone marrow is quite widely accepted, uh, especially um, you know, when it is explained carefully. Um, but there might be other areas where it is not, where the need is not so pressing, the medical problem is not so severe, and there is an alternative available. So I think the choices, not only dependent on a particular technology, but what the other alternatives are, 
for either an individual or a society in terms of uh, you know quality of life. Could I jump in here? I think the question uh, could potentially also be read in a different way, which is that stem cells often cause controversy in certain places. Um, so it isn't the kind of um, acceptability of the end product, but the idea that stem cells as the, as the kind of basic unit in some countries is quite controversial. And so, you know, I guess the question could also be read as, you know, stem cell research is yeah. always controversial, but I, I don't think that stem cell research in uh, India is controversial, but I wonder if you well, might be able to, or you, I might not know. Um, yeah, but, yeah. But, but I think that, that so, so the stem cell part of the controversy bit, I mean, I don't know if Sujata or both of you might know more about this than I. Yeah, I wonder if, if you could I speak may, about that. If I may just uh, quickly jump in and say something here. Uh, that's, thanks for bringing up that point up. I think the question was actually directed towards this thing which you mentioned rather than what I was alluding to. The controversy surrounding the use of stem cells for human therapy. Um, in the past, it has mostly arisen from the question of where the source of the stem cells is. Um, you know, is it right to take it from someone else? Is it right to take it from whatever source you choose to take it, umbilical cord stem cells or, or a fetus or, or, or whatever it is? So that will not go away. But I should say that the, the technology that I just described at the beginning of this, this session was one where you were taking a blood sample from the person itself or a skin sample from the patient. And then in the, the lab, you are converting it into a stem cell. So there is, in terms of its ethical considerations, or it, and its practical difficulties, it is only as bad as donating a sample of blood for a blood sugar test. We only take five ml of blood from a patient, isolate the blood cells, and then convert them into stem cells. So for that particular reason, this so-called indu induced pluripotent stem cell technology might prove less contentious than the pre pre previous technology which involved collecting stem cells from in utero or from the umbilical cord and, and other locations. So that's the difference between this new technology and the, and the extant one, uh, which, is for, uh, which was very controversial. Yeah. So yeah, that do, do you want to add something in as well? Um, I was just gonna say, um, I, in a way, I think Raghu addressed it, because um, going back to the earlier discussion about acceptance, um, I think one of the things uh, certainly I'm finding in some of my work, other work I've done on gene drive, for example, um, that it's helpful to think in terms of acceptability because rather than acceptance, if you like, um, and uh, um, it might just seem wordplay, but um, you know, when we, when we frame it in terms of acceptability, then it opens up um, uh, consideration and awareness of all those issues, um, Raghu, that you just raised about, you know, what are the conditions under which um, something is more or less um, uh, acceptable. Um, and I think, yeah, um, I mean, public deliberations, all the work that's been done on public deliberations, um, you know, routinely show that, yeah, as you've uh, both Sridhar and Raghu have already mentioned, um, you know, people are capable of, um, uh, yeah, thinking about these these big issues, um, thinking about it, not just even from their own standpoint or what's in their interest, but what is in the wider public good, um, if you like, you know, that, that is, um, that's something I think we keep finding that people are able to think at that level, irrespective of, you know, um, where, where they come from. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, but yeah, in a way, I think uh, Raghu had already addressed it, but uh, thinking in terms of acceptability, I think, allows that wider conversation um, that I was talking about. Okay. So I think definitely it's sort of become clearer from this conversation that we need to have the public involved in this, right? And keep sort of bringing this to the forefront where we could have more discussions like these and sort of keep uh, 
updating both ourselves and you know the community around us as to what exactly is happening and how do we start thinking about this because uh like we realize there are so many things that are happening that we don't know about and then to be able to come in and ask the right questions of it is uh is really critical and it's equally important that there is this level of trust that is gendered through this through these conversations so when it comes to the point of when we require a public deliberation about it we are sort of primed to think and you know make uh, what have be able to have a critical opinion uh, on it so i think it's it is a process clearly um that will require like i said much engagement between scholars who are doing the research scholars who are thinking about these uh, questions in the terms of the ethics in terms of laws regulation policies and in terms and for the public so um thank you so much uh, and uh, i'm really uh, grateful that we were able to have this conversation and i hope this will be one of many where science gallery is able to sort of explore uh, new technologies and uh, start provoking these sort of discussions uh, around research especially emerging research um so thank you so much raghu uh, sujata and shrikar and uh, like raghu said if you missed the conversation or you'd like to rewatch it to sort of better understand and dive deeper into the issues we spoke about uh you can watch it on our youtube channel at the recording uh similarly i just like to suggest a couple of interesting programs for those who enjoyed today's session there is a talk by ali husaini which is titled can machines come alive um from looking at the concept of aliveness from another perspective and a very interesting lab walk through from disease to dish a closer look at the accelerator program from discovery in brain disorders using stem cells where we will actually be going through the various experimental spaces both at ncbs and nimhans where a lot of this research is happening so and that's on 15th may at 2:30 pm so several of the researchers who are part of the work that i've spoke about will be there and will actually get to see some of these things happening live in the labs so do sign up for that as well and do share your free uh, feedback with us on what you thought of today's session what you're thinking about this topic and uh, do see the exhibition before it closes thank you so much again uh, sujata shridhar and raghu uh, it was a pleasure having you all here and we look forward to seeing you again thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you.